best car is the most honest car you ever see. It's been a dream ever since I've had it. The first time I heard that engine screaming, I thought, I gotta have one of those. For me, the cars have personality. What's great about a BMW Classic is the community that surrounds it. When you listen to that, <laughs> that's why we're here. Welcome to Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. My name is JP. And I have a guest today who can talk a lot about growing up between racing cars and horse racing and all cool things that could happen in life. Our guest today is Charles March. Charles, shall I go by the full title or is it okay if we stick to Charles March? Charlie's completely fine. More than okay. happy with Charlie. <laughs> but for the background, so if I'm not mistaken, the full title is Charles Henry Gordon Lennox, Earl of March and Kinara. The shorter version. Charlie, you grew up in Goodwood House. Uh, that's very close to Goodwood Racetrack, which is in the car scene, a very well known location in the UK. Your father, Duke of Richmond, founded both the Festival of Speed and the Revival. Would you say car passion is a thing of yours? Yeah, I think I think my father would have probably disowned me if it wasn't, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, I grew up so closely intertwined with motor racing that you know I fell in love with it from a very early age. Yeah. I mean, as a small boy, loud, fast cars are about the most attractive thing you can possibly see. And when they're happening right outside your house, you know, you can't help but fall in love. And uh, today you're 28 and um, many people know the place where you grew up. But for those who don't, I would appreciate if you just share a little bit about Goodwood, the Goodwood estate. So actually, what is Goodwood? Yeah, so Goodwood's a, an old English estate. Um, the way I describe it to people is basically we do everything that's English, but in a really fun way. Mm -hmm. And we've been, my family been living here for 350 years. The first Duke was the bastard son of Charles II and Louise de Carraway. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lived in London when the house burnt down in London. They moved down here and, and built up around a hunting lodge they owned. They built up the house in the mid 18th century. And my family have been living down here at full time ever since. And we've had a lot of sporting events kind of beginning here from, you know, one of the earliest race courses in 1802 to the first ever game of cricket. And we have the earliest rules of cricket in the family archives. Um, oh, wow. And the, the Goodwood Cricket Club was founded in 1702. Um, the first ever fox hunt in held in England was here. And we have the recorded kind of description of that. So we have a great sporting tradition and history. And then in 1946, my great grandfather started the motor circuit and uh, operated that from 1946 to 1966 when he decided to shut it down because the Formula One cars were getting too fast yeah. and the wings uh, on the back of them were, were making them too dangerous. So he didn't want to be responsible for any more Formula One deaths after Bruce McLaren died at Goodwood and Sterling Moss had his career ending crash. Yeah. So that track was shut down then. And my father took over the estate in 1990 And in 1990, from 1990 to 1992, he tried to do the start the revival and reopen the track, but the council, local council here wouldn't let him. Mm -hmm. So he ended up saying, well, I'm going to do a, a event outside of my house and, and that's all private roads, so I can do it. And that was how the Festival Speed started was because he couldn't do the revival. And then after two years of doing the Festival Speed or four years of doing the Festival Speed, he went back to the council and said, look, this is a huge success. Can we, can we do the revival now? And they said, yes. Yeah. So we ended up with two car events for the price of one, luckily for us. Yeah. Wow. So um, how was growing up in the estate? Is it like, is it a normal life? Is it a bit different? Well, I think my parents did a really good job when I was younger of making me not realize how weird it was. Um, yeah. And I remember when I was growing up, I would want to go to my friends' houses because they were allowed to go on the computer later than me. And I would want them okay. to come to my house because we would be better. We would have a better setup for hide and seek. Yeah. And that was really the only difference <laughs> that yeah. any of me and my friends saw <laughs> when we were kind of six, seven, eight. And then obviously, as you start getting older, you realize that it's, um, uh, that it is weird. Yeah. And, uh, it was a very special place to grow up though, because we do have so many amazing things, extraordinary events going on. Yeah. I kind of got exposed to, uh, so many interesting people, so many interesting moments and, and things happening that it was just a constant rush always, you know, every few weeks there's something else going on and we'd be hosting and looking after people and doing this and running around. So that was a great exposure for me just to help me grow up quickly and being forced to kind of stand up and, and say my piece to people who quite frankly were, you know, leaders in many different fields. And yeah. suddenly you're looking after them as a 10 year old, showing them around the estate. And, and it was a very, um, it's a very lucky and fortunate experience. So you learned quite early to be a good host, right? A great host. Yeah. I mean, that was, that's basically our job here is, you yeah. know, aside from, aside from all the operations of actually setting up the event, what, what we're really trying to do is 
allow people into our into our home, into our lives and make sure they have a great time. And that's the yeah. that's the beauty of what my dad's done, I think, is everyone who comes here feels like they're part of the family and part of the event and part of the estate and they, everyone should feel very welcome. And I think a big part of that is how we can act as a family to make everyone feel included. It needs a strong backbone as family to do all this. And uh, I remember when I had a, I'd done some interviews with your father for Classic Driver and others. And I, I remember that he was saying like, when you ask him, what are you looking forward? He said Monday yeah. on the weekends of the events. And I totally can get that because you just see him rushing around from appointment to appointment, organizing this and that. And also all you guys as well. I mean, it's not an easy task, but I think you described in a beautiful way how it made also possible to grow up quickly and also learn about amazing people. I mean, that's also the beautiful thing. I mean, I'm doing this for 25 years now. And I think this is, is why I love this so much because you meet really great people. And that's uh, absolutely the core of it or the beauty of all this car connection or car craziness. Um, let's jump back to the car events because um, I would like to, we would like to learn about yourself a little bit later, but I think we need to describe this fantastic atmosphere. So we have three major car events besides, I mean, there's on the racetrack always like a track day. There's the breakfast club, there's everything, right? But let's focus on the main event. So we have the members meeting which is in the beginning of the year, so it kicks off the season. We have the Festival of Speed and then the Revival. So is it fair to ask which one is your favorite? <laughs> um, I think my favorite is probably the Revival just because of how unique it is. And I think the creativity and the, the passion behind the event is really amazing. Bringing people, the, the, first, the, the original tagline of the event was a magical step back in time. Mm -hmm. And it really does feel like that when you're there, you feel like you're almost in a movie. And it is an incredible thing. Yeah. The atmosphere at the other two events is great as well, but I just think the revival is exceptionally good at bringing people out of their lives and into the moment. Uh, well said. And you have to imagine, uh, for those who have never been, uh, the good revival is a travel in time. Everyone is dressed in period. Everything looks like it was either from the 20s, 30s, 60s or 70s from a hairdresser who does it in the old fashioned world with burning your hair and all these kind of things. And also the love for the detail is fantastic. I mean, you can imagine that there is no cash machine in the 30s. So what they've done is they put the cash machines to get the money to buy the beautiful things in the vintage market. Uh, what they did is they put it in old phone booths. So like the, the traditional red phone booth that everyone uh, remembers and uh, all these kind of things. So there's a massive, massive work behind that. It must be a great team and a super creative team, I have to imagine. Yeah, no, our, our team are amazing. They And they, they do such a great job. And my dad's very creative and he comes up with a lot of crazy ideas and yeah. they've got increasingly good at just implementing them and coming up with their own a lot of the time. And it's uh, it's we're very fortunate to have such a great team. It wouldn't be possible without them at all. And would you describe the other two events in your own words? Yeah. So I think for me, the festival speed is increasingly more about the future of mobility. Yeah. Thinking how and why people move around the world, how we have moved, how we are moving and how we will move. Um, thinking about the history of cars, the history of transportation and racing and what that might look like in the future. So, you know, we're looking at more and more stuff around drones, planes, boats, and different forms of transport, not just, uh, not just motorsport and cars. Yeah. But equally, it's a it's an exploration of car culture over time and uh, and over history. And every year, we celebrate different moments and different eras of cars and uh, racing, and having that amazing amalgamation of of different types of cars all around is totally unique. You know, having drift cars, Formula One cars, Le Mans cars, rally cars, supercars, old cars, new cars, concept cars, all over the place is just incredible. Um, and it really has become the industry's way of expressing what they're working on and what they think the future is as well. So yeah. in that way, I think the first speed is the most important event we do because it is the expression of the industry now. And it's taken over the place of a lot of these motor shows in terms of for OEMs to show off what they, what they're making and what they want to sell. But equally it's become a place for gathering for all car lovers from every single walk of the sport, Yeah, which is fantastic. And then the members meeting, I think is also a really special event. And for uh, the way I see it is it's the event that the people who really love historic racing love the most. The revival is in some ways, you know, too big and has so many other focuses now away from the cars with the fashion and the, the dancing and the, it's a big party. You know? Yeah. Um, whereas the members meeting is really just about the cars and the, the, the feeling we were going for with the members meeting was one of those 
quintessentially English 70s, 80s um, race day meets that were kind of somewhat badly organized with like not <laughs> no real infrastructure. I mean, like, hey, how can we do one of these great old events, but in a Goodwood way? Um, and I think it's really managed to capture that feeling of these old car meets where everyone's just hanging out, you know, chatting to each other, seeing the drivers, everyone's friends. And it's that's really nice. And I think everyone really, really appreciates that. Yeah, it's one of the more intimate events, I would say, even though very big sure. and very successful. But I think uh, that's also what it makes very beautiful. Um, there is a lot of work and all putting all this together besides all the other events also going on. I mean, how much time is there for, how much family time is left? <laughs> um, we're very close as a family. I think we're very fortunate that we all, all our siblings get along very well. Yeah. We do spend a good amount of time together and we always try and go on at least one trip away together in the year just to make sure that we're all spending time time with each other because we all live in pretty different parts of the country or the world and, and, yeah. and it's good to get back together. Are you living still in Goodwood? No, I live in New York. So what are you doing in New York? So I just finished my MBA. Um, oh, wow. Congrats. I finished uh, just over a month ago, which was great. And then I'm now just launched my venture capital fund. So I invest in mobility and logistics and everything that impacts how people or things move around the world. Mega. I mean, that's also a very interesting field, right? Yeah, I know. It's really cool. I work for a, a great fund part-time whilst I was doing my uh, MBA and that enabled me to kind of go off and do my own thing after. Yeah. Also, you just started a fashion line, right? Or a fashion brand to be yeah. more precise. Tell us more about that. That's uh, more of a passion project, I guess. It's something I've okay. always really, really loved. And we're just in the process of doing our first collection now. And that comes out at the end of end of October, early November. And it's been it's been a really fun experience. Part of my thinking behind it is we do a lot of retail at Goodwood and, and that's something that I think we can do a much bigger and better job with. So if I can understand the industry and the space better before I come home, then perhaps when I when I get here, I can do a bit a bit more around that when I do come back. And it's been a great experience so far. So hopefully it all, all kicks off well. Mega. I mean, uh, you can share the name with us, please. And then tell us also what's the DNA about that brand. Yeah, of course. So it's called Understated Era and yeah. it's all about trying to create this premium line of clothes, which are to enable people to wear clothes that they really love, beautifully made clothes, made of traditional English fabrics like tartan, tweeds and wools, but in a much more modern way. And we're playing on this idea of understatedness and, you know, you should be able to wear clothes that you feel comfortable in and that are cool without having to shout about them, without having to have logos all over them, without having to be really, really in your face. So kind of muted colors and but beautiful silhouettes and shapes and, and fabrics that really enable, um, the wearer to feel really comfortable and confident in what they're wearing. We cannot wait to see more of that. And I hope that you also do so like massive, a massive collection out of that, that I can also go into that because uh, what <laughs> I saw so far looks very, very cool. I have to say, I Thank mean, you. the perfect, that could be the next perfect rival outfit. Yeah. Yeah. It would be good. In the modern way. So we spoke a lot about the revival and I mean, uh, is the revival the biggest one or is the festival of speed the biggest one? What would you say? Uh, the first speed is the biggest in both terms of participation, like numbers of people, yeah. and also in terms of just the scale of the event, in terms of how much building and work we have to do to get it off the ground. Yeah. What is the spectators' numbers there? This year that we had the most, well, apart from our, the sadness of Saturday, we yes. would have had, definitely had by far the most. Um, it's roughly 70,000 people a day. Oh, wow. I mean, that's exactly... Yeah. <laughs> But say, so, you know, you need to have a big garden to host 70,000 yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, luckily um, we have space. So let's get it like a bit of an order. So the Festival of Speed is the hill climb in the large garden. Uh, it goes up the hill in front of the of Goodwood House. Yeah. And then the members meeting and the revival happening on the Goodwood racetrack, the, the racetrack your grandfather built. Um, that's also the place where BMW Group Classic is always present with March Motor Works, a historic like inspired workshop. Could we jump into that story? Because I mean, that's very interesting. Your, so your grandfather was working for a workshop. Yeah, his passion was really around building engines and designing cars and planes and flying them and driving them. Yeah, He was a great, great racing driver, a great pilot. And that was his passion. And so he had March Motorworks, which was a kind of coach builder yeah. in London. And that is what we've kind of styled March Motorworks off at the Revival from. Obviously, it's a period building from originally when he was there and we kind of took a lot of the, that design and style and put it into that building at Revival. So it's a very meaningful, special place for us. There's also a March race car, right? Is that also connected to the family or is it like completely no, just that, coincidence? No, that's separate. Yeah. 
So the March racing team is is a separate thing. And I, when yeah. I was little, I always thought it was, I always thought it was uh, <laughs> to do with us. And, uh, and uh, I, was, I was wrong. But I could understand that, that as a kid, you have the idea of, okay, that's uh, also part of our family, same name, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> of course it must be. Um, are you, I mean, do you have already an active role in, you said you hosted, like when you were 10, you started hosting together with the whole family. But is there a plan for you to take a more active role in the Goodwood events? Yeah, absolutely. Over time, um, the long-term plan is for me to come back and take over at some point when my dad's, uh, my dad's done. And I don't think that's going to be for a while. I mean, you know how fit and active he is and yes. how much he loves running the events. So I don't think that's going to be for a while, but that is the long-term plan. And I stay in touch with the business and anything that has a kind of five plus year time horizon I'm very involved with. Um, the day-to-day -day operation and things like that, I'm not so involved with because I'm trying to do my own thing and create my own identity outside of uh, outside of the estate, which I think is important for me to feel like I can go and do things uh, off my own back rather than uh, be reliant here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's also what you mentioned. And I think you've done already. So you moved to New York, you did uh, your studies done, uh, you created your own firm and also a fun project, which is going into the fashion way. So, I mean, uh, that's already... I think it's quite a track record for 28 year old, I have to say. <laughs> I, I mean, so. it's not too bad, not too shabby, as you would say in Britain, <laughs> I would uh, think so. So I see the same activity level as with your father, I have to say, uh, in the terms of uh, what to do and what not to do. But let's speak also about some fun on track. Are you a car racer? Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Um, I haven't been able to do it since much moving to, since I moved to America, just because of the complexities of logistics of racing in America yeah. um, and my lack of free time there, which is unfortunate, but I definitely want to get back into it again. Before I moved out there, I was doing uh, the Porsche Sprint in mm -hmm. the Caymans, which I loved. And that was really, that was a great experience. I've raced a lot of historics over the years and racing a 911 at this year's revival, which will be really fun. Oh, wow. Mega. There's is a two liter class, isn't it? No? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You have a strong competitor. Because Gabi von Oppenheim, she was also one of our guests here. She has her premiere with together with Queenie Laumann in one team. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and they are keen in winning, I have to say. They are <laughs> not coming for fun. They come for the win. And uh, I just, uh, because in the preparation of our, our talk now, I just uh, had a little chat with Gabi and she was so excited. Actually, just yesterday, she shared the letter uh, sending that she was accepted to join and she shared it on Instagram and was so, so happy about it that she can uh, come. Awesome. It's her very, very first time. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's going to be big fun. Are you driving on your own or in a team? No, I'm driving with James Turner in his uh, oh, wow. in his Porsche in, nine, in the Stripey, yeah. which will wow. be really fun. Yes. For me, it's not not about being competitive. That's about not embarrassing myself and crashing in front of everyone. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's I think, also very important. I think crashing on my own racetrack would be about as embarrassing as it gets. So yeah. <laughs> just try and hide in the middle of the pack and make sure no one knows yeah, I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can leave the competitors part out of Goodwood and that's okay. Let yeah, the exactly. others have some fun and then you show them on the other tracks uh, uh, what so to do. I can do it elsewhere. Um, so you see new classes of cars. You see modern Japanese race cars as well not a revival, but I mean, on the festival of speed and you see lots of trending cars like resto mods, all these kind of things. Yeah. Would you say that the next generation or that you guys help within the siblings that you really help to be on like, to not, don't get too old fashioned in a sense to keep this modern in a way or. I mean, I don't think my dad needs any help with that. He's incredibly good at, at reinventing everything we're doing constantly every year, mm -hmm. making sure that we have the most interesting relevant cars at each event and being a big part of that and I, I don't think that we would do any better than him at trying to think about what was modern and cool so we leave the content and uh form of the events to him and we have a fantastic team as well who yeah you know have their ear to the ground in the automotive world they know everything that's going on and they have a great understanding of of the, both the history and the authenticity and the credibility of every single car that we see um so they do a fantastic job and also i mean The Goodwood team is very strong in the social media game. And uh, for those tuned in, if you're not following on Instagram or any other channel you prefer, uh, one of the Goodwood channels, please do, because it's amazing the kind of news they put together in between the events, all these kind of things. I mean, they know their game and they know their ABCs very, very well, I have to say. So a big shout out to the Goodwood team from, from this side of the channel. Um, coming back to racing, um, do you remember your first time you really raced? Was it on Revival or was it up the hill? No, the first time I raced 
well, the hill was the first time I did stuff at Goodwood. I wouldn't really call it racing. I was trying to like go as slow as I could and not embarrass myself. How old um, were you there then, back then? Uh, it's probably, I can't remember if I was able to do it before I got a racing license or not. If I, yeah. if not, it was around 15, 16. Yeah. But I was racing when I was 16, once I got my license in Austin A35s. And that mm -hmm. was my first race series, which was incredible fun. Every single car was basically the same. Yeah. And uh, it went meant for very, very close, very, very good racing. Yeah. And the cars were pretty safe. So even if you, they rolled quite easily, but even if you yeah. rolled them, you would kind of be, you were pretty much okay because you're going about 10 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that was really great experience to learn. And I got my license and upgraded my license through that. And you, cause the cars do have so little power, you really learn how to manage them and to, to kind of keep the speed through the corners and not be aggressive with the car. Yeah. which is an incredibly important thing to learn for historic racing generally. So that was a really, really good experience. Can you remember the first time you sit there? What was going through your head? Yeah, I mean, when I'm racing, I'm not, I get a little bit nervous when I'm kind of waiting around. I think that's the, the hardest thing about racing is the amount of free time you have mm. before and after and around the race. As soon as you're kind of sitting in the car ready to go, it's a bit like what I imagine an actor on stage would have is once you're waiting there, you think you're going to forget all your lines. Yeah. And then once you get on stage, you kind of go into acting mode or work mode or whatever it is. And, and you, you're just okay. And I think that's roughly similar to how I feel. And once you, once you're sitting, when you're sitting on the start line, waiting for the lights to change, you're like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And then suddenly yeah. <laughs> the lights go out and you go. And then, and then once you're racing, you, you're just fully focused in the moment because you realize yeah. that as soon as your, as soon as your mind drifts, you're screwed. So you're really just in full focus mode. Yeah. So just do one imaginary round in Goodwood on the racetrack. I mean, it is quite a challenging one because it's very narrow. It's not very wide. You have some uh, corners that are not too easy to take on. So we, we, you sit in your little Austin and you start off uh, with a high speed of uh, 10 miles plus an hour. No, it's a bit quicker, to be honest. I mean, let's uh, yeah. 10 miles power is the corner speed, maybe. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you take off and then just describe the track from your point of view when you're racing. So where's yeah. the dangerous points? Where What's challenging? So as a whole, I love the track. I think it's a really amazing, amazing track. And I know I'm obviously biased in saying that, but That's okay. any, for anyone who's driven it, they will agree with me that it's both one of the most dangerous, but also one of the most enjoyable tracks you can drive. And it's the only track that's still original from its, its format in the, mm -hmm. in the forties. And so the first corner is great. You kind of come in, it's a pretty high speed corner, double apex. You drift through the this middle part of it, come out of the first corner into a straight with a slight kink in it. Mm -hmm. In a modern car, the kink is flat. And I've taken that at about 145 miles an hour in, in a modern Porsche. In an old car, you have to lift <laughs> or sometimes brake and the back comes out a little bit and it's a pretty scary, hairy moment. You slide around that. And then you come into what we call no name, which is a fast right-hander, which mm -hmm. uh, was where Sterling Moss had his big crash. It's much mm -hmm. faster than you think it's going to be. So people, when they're driving the track for the first time, always over brake. And it's actually where the track gets to its widest. It's just coming out of that corner. And then you have to get back over to the right-hand side of the track very quickly, hard brake, hard left onto, up onto the curb uh, to push yourself through the second part of that corner. Then you go into a beautiful dip and up round into a soft right hand and then uh, hard brake into Lavin, which is the sharpest corner on the track. And it's got a slight off camber. So you, you hit the apex and you, get, you think you're fine and you get pushed right out wide <laughs> and you get a lot of people spinning on that corner because yeah. they don't realize that they have that slight camber. Then you have the long straight down the back, which has a slight left kink in it, but is all flat for every car. And it's the, the straight where you see all the big galaxies overtaking the little minis. Yes. And uh, that goes down the back. And then you come into Woodcourt, which is the second last corner on the track. Again, a double apex, but you miss the first apex. And then take the second one uh, as quickly as you can to try and build up speed for the short straight before it coming into the chicane. And then the chicane is a, a right and a left. And that was ad added after the, in, in the modern period. So even though the track's the same, that corner wasn't there in the original period. Okay. You come through there um, and then hard on the accelerator the, across the start finish line on that straight. And the remarkably in, in period, the pit wall wasn't there and neither was the, neither was the chicane. So cars would come through what was a, a left-hander and they yeah. would drift right out onto this very thin patch of grass while all the mechanics were the other side of that working on the yeah, cars. Imagine. And it was just actually crazy. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, you really feel that. And I, I think the recommendation is when you visit the revival, just take your time, go to Levin because it's the most exciting 
point of view, in my opinion, to watch the races. You have a nice overview, you see the cars coming down, you see what they do in that corner, and then you see them heading off. And I think that's a very beautiful thing. So Levant is the place to be to watch uh, some exciting racing. And I mean, if someone who's not been there think that's it's like, okay, you know, you, you can't really watch it and stuff like that. No, no, a revival is hyper professional with big screens. You have like commentators going all on it, sharing all the information and getting very excited, by the way. And I mean, that's something uh, very special. And also, if you can watch now, if you can't wait till September, uh, you can also join the YouTube channel. And you see all the greatest moments of all the races. And you're referring to one of my greatest moments because I don't know if you know, uh, Charlie, but Classic Driver had a racing team for a couple of years. And we were not racing in the Galaxy, but in a fair lane, Holman Moody fair lane. Yeah. And our drivers were Barney Groheimer and Fred uh, Firestone. And um, I mean, the, the battles, I mean, every mini was like beating up them in the corners. But the straight man, done deal. Yeah. yeah. I think and then the Mini comes back through the inside. It's such a fun race. Yeah. I raced a Mini in that one and it really is, it really is hilarious. And everyone is in such a good mood. All the drivers yes. just having a great time because it's back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Um, it's a David Goliath say, race. Yeah, exactly. And as you say, the, the racing itself is incredibly high quality and you we have some of the best drivers in the world yeah. and some of the most original, exceptional cars driving them as hard as they can. So for anyone that's worried that they think they're going to come and see a bunch of old cars going slowly around a track, I can no. assure you that it's the most exciting racing you're probably ever going to see. Absolutely. Uh, tell us more about the Mini feeling. So how is it driving in the Mini there? Because I mean, that's, you can go quite quick in the Mini. I mean, we know Swifty with all his, his yeah. Mini creations. They are very, very quick, I have to say. They're like a very for winning in a sense as well. So how was going in the Mini next to these big machines from America? It was so fun. I came out with the biggest grin on my face because you do really feel, it really feels like you're in some sort of comic book yeah. uh, if, or in like wacky races. I don't know if you have that in Germany, but a cartoon from my childhood where you have all these people in these crazy cars yeah. doing crazy things to try and win these races. And it really feels like that. You're kind of every corner, you're diving down the inside and, and scooting around the edge of the galaxies as they kind of lumber and swat slide and swerve around the corners. Yeah. And you think you've made it past them. And then suddenly down the straight, you hear the kind of roar of, you have no, <laughs> some mythical creature behind you. And suddenly this huge tower block comes zooming past you and you don't quite, you can't quite see the driver because they're so much higher than you. So, you. so you don't really know. And suddenly it comes shooting, zooming past and then back into the corner and you're zooming around the inside again. Yeah. And uh, have you ever the chance to race Tom Christensen, who is like one of the one of the Goodwood supporters in the racing, I would say, or like, of yeah, course, all he's, the others. he's amazing. And he's yeah. really, uh, he's been supportive for a long time and you know, he races in the TT every year. And I'm sure I have raced against him in, in some races, but I can't remember exactly. Probably in the, in the, the race on the Friday night at Goodwood, yeah. which is always a great one. I probably raced against him in that and in the St. Mary's as well. But you know, as I said, I try and keep a bit of a low profile yes. so that I don't, you know, no, so people aren't out to get me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but I mean, how can we think about this? Like you say, okay, so Charlie's back from New York. It's the week before horse racing or whatever, or the Good Wolf, which is also a fantastic event. I mean, this alone is genius. I love the name of it already. <laughs> so just to give a background, so that's like, it's an event for celebrating dogs, like everything yeah. around the dogs, which is like a big thing in the UK and of course, over all the globe. Um, so how could you imagine that one? Like, do you say, um, can I take a car to take a spin on the racetrack? Is that possible? Or do you have like secret uh, training sessions for you? In terms of uh, the actual racing itself or in terms of uh, just, just being at home and wanting to drive around? Yes, just being at home and uh, maybe have a little bit of, a, you know, you don't take that advantage because, as you said, you keep it low profile and file driving in the midfields, but to really like train yourself a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of laps around the track at home. Yeah. And if we have a track day going on, I can normally sneak in and just join the track day. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, when the track wasn't operating, my dad was able to use it and he would call up the airfield and say, if you see a car going around, don't worry, it's just me. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and we didn't have to have stewards and, and marshals in place because there was no insurance and no operational yeah. risk. And now obviously with the licensing and stuff like that, we, we can't operate the track without having the full, the full safety team. Yeah. So I can't sneak onto it, you know, early in the morning or late at night. But um, I do try and use it when I'm around and, and we have a lot of fun. 
And how about motorcycles? I mean, we see a lot of BMW motorcycles and very successful racing um, with Sebastian Racing. And Historic Racing is actually a lawyer in doing this, which I really appreciate. So um, how is motorcycle? Is it also something you're interested in? I love bikes. I ride a lot around on a scrambler at home off-road. Yeah. My dad used to ride bikes on the road, but he had a big crash or and a, maybe a couple of big crashes. So he, oh, wow. he always said, he always said I could never uh, get my bike license, which has been a shame. And I, you know, something I'm still tempted by and now I'm a bit older, you know, I recognize that he can't stop me. So there might, <laughs> there might be a time where I get it, but for now I've managed to uh, obey the rules and Good. haven't got one yet. Um, but the bike racing at the Revival is fantastic and always an amazing race. And then this year at the Festa Speed, it was the first time that it wasn't on a MotoGP weekend. So we were able yeah. to have a lot of the a lot of the big MotoGP riders. All the teams were here with all their bikes and that was really spectacular. So actually everything which has an engine is celebrated in Goodwood. And this is also what I like. And I think we should speak about a bit of the future of these events. I mean, the Festival of Speed is clearly uh, with the Future Lab and all these kind of things, they really like are already focusing on alternatives or how the future of mobility could look like as you also mentioned, drones, everything. I mean, it's really actually everything. But how do you see the the coming years for the revival? Yeah, so I think the revival is a really interesting one because it's obviously locked to a time period. So, yeah. you know, we're not going to be suddenly starting to show new cars or show different things. You know, the, the track operation from 1946 to 1966, and that's the only time period where cars who are racing at the rival are allowed to come from. And all the races that we decide and, and create are, are based upon that time period. So the cars themselves won't change. A lot of the younger drivers are now getting involved and they're really enjoying driving those old cars. So we're not worried at all about participation or by people coming to enjoy the racing. I think people really love that period and really love those cars racing. And it's fantastic to see them. And there are beautiful, beautiful things. The big change that we're making, and we're already well on our way to doing that, is trying to turn the whole event into a, a sustainable event where we can talk about the importance of looking after beautiful old objects, mm -hmm. reinvigorating them and continuing to love them over time rather than just buying new things. So in an ideal world, everyone who comes to the revival will be wearing secondhand clothes. All the shops there will be selling secondhand things and whether that's vintage, classic, whatever it is, yeah. they're not new things that have been remade and um, not stuff that people are just selling to as, for consumption. And we try and tell that story around the cars as well, because it's very easy to look at these old cars and think that they're, you know, unenvironmental and, and bad for the world because of the fumes and the, the mm. fuel they use. But in reality, once these cars have been made, it's much better to continue to look after them and continue to use them than it is to buy a new car. So our story is look after your old car, drive your old car for as long as you can, rather than buy a new car every year, because making those new cars and consuming all that stuff is not the, the good thing for the world. So sustainability is a big topic. And I mean, also for as far as I understood it, but correct me if I'm wrong, all the, so like kind of the products from Goodwood Farm, they're very locally produced. So there's less like transportation for the burger buns and all these kind of things. So you're really trying to keep it local and also you help the local community. I mean, it's West Sussex. I think it's, it's a beautiful place in the UK. So um, what about the thing of um, like alternative petrol in a sense, like synthetic fuels and all those kind of things. Is that also a topic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the revival this year, we're trialing um, some Aramco sustainable synthetic fuel. Mm -hmm. And ideally, we will have all cars operating on that at the revival. It's very hard with classic cars, as you know, to get the get the mixture right because they need yeah. a different kind of fuel than modern cars. Yeah, Sebastian Vettel ran his car on synthetic fuel at the Festa Speed this year. And we do a lot of electric, obviously a lot of electric cars and a lot of hydrogen cars. Having said that, you know, we're not trying to change. We don't want to, we don't want these cars to operate badly just because of they're using the wrong kind of fuel. And I think sure. one car in one race is, you know, a meaninglessly small amount of uh, emissions. So if we're going to risk damaging the engine or damaging the car, we wouldn't do that. Um, but ultimately we will want the, all the events to be fully sustainable. And um, once it's appropriate with the right technology and the right fuels. Yeah. So we are working on that and it's a big challenge to get it all right, but we're, we're definitely making good progress. Um, and a lot of the big suppliers of fuel are, are trying harder and harder to make synthetic sustainable fuels. So I don't think it'll be a long time before all the cars are able to operate on that kind of thing. And I mean, let's speak about Rolls Royce because uh, your neighbor on Goodwood grounds is uh, Rolls Royce. So Rolls Royce getting produced in Goodwood. I don't know exactly since when, but you, maybe you can help me with that because I'm not Yes, yeah, since aware. the 90s. Yeah. And if you look at the rate of Rolls Royces on the road, I think they have the, they're the one manufacturer with the highest rate of produce cars that are still running. 
So yeah. it's kind of sustainable, I would say. Absolutely. And Rolls Royce as a brand is incredible. People don't want to get rid of them. People love them and they really are the most comfortable things. And for me also, you look at their new Spectre, the electric car. Yeah. That makes so much sense to me because, you know, Rolls Royce is designed for you to be driven in. You're not really, you're not, if you're buying a Rolls Royce, it's unlikely you're going to be, well, you might not be driving it yourself. And yeah. sitting in a quiet electric car as a passenger is a very nice experience. You don't want to be driving something loud and fast necessarily yeah. when you're sitting in the back seat. So that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it shows that there's a lot of interesting ways to kind of really push people into these products that are so important for the world um, yeah. in interesting ways. I mean, if Rolls Royce would have been able to build very efficient and working electric engines, I think that would definitely be their choice. Because I think there's one quote from Mr. Royce saying that the only thing you should hear in a Rolls Royce is the clinking of the car keys, which are hitting each other. So there's no engine sound. So that's, I think that was always the goal. So it makes yeah, completely exactly. sense. Have you ever visited the factory? Yeah, lots of times. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a magical place because if you see the people working in the, in for generations now, third generation people working for Rolls Royce, creating this marvels on wheels. Also, it's a bit like time travel. I mean, look at the guy who's doing the, the body lines by hand, everything, or like the, the wood and stuff. So it's really amazing. Does Rolls Royce also use the track for a bit of a uh, Rolls Royce phantom wafting? <laughs> I mean, we, we do these small track days, me and my dad, uh, kind of in May, March, April, yeah. May. And uh, a lot of the supercar manufacturers bring down their new cars for us to, and, uh, and guests to, and we bring down kind of partners and sponsors and friends. Yeah. And we drive around lots of stuff and yeah. Rolls Royce always bring a couple of cars. And it's always, it's a pretty fun experience trying to drive one around a track. Um, yeah. And they're, they're really great and they're much faster than people imagine them to be. I remember that, uh, I think 11 years ago, 12 years ago, we got a new Phantom and uh, we, we wrote an article called Mountain Wafting because we took it down the Julia Pass in the Engadina. Yeah. And uh, this car was really like, it was unable to slide it or something like this. It was, even though you switch off everything, it was so stable, but it was damn quick. Even yeah, they up, really are. Even up, it was really like, like fantastic. Um, speaking about friends and garages, how does your own garage look like? So what is your daily drive? I mean, do we have a car in New York? I don't have a car in New York. Um, Wise decision. I'm tempted to try and get something to just have that I can take out to the country or whatever out there, but no, nothing at the moment. In England, I have, I have an E-Type, which I've had for about eight years, wow. which I love. And I have kind of stolen my dad's 1931 Model A Ford uh, hot rod, which I love. Yeah. So I have two not very practical cars, um, yeah. <laughs> but I'd much rather drive something fun than practical. So yes, I mean the Ford can be seen also at the governor parking in, uh, yeah. in, the, in the members meeting. I love it because it's so like out of place in a sense, and also totally in place because yeah. the celebration of everything is cool. But is it like is that car road legal? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I get stopped every time I drive it, but it is yeah. really legal. <laughs> um, if you follow the exact letter of the law. It has a license plate, all done. It's got its original 1931 Ohio number plate. So yeah. uh, the police Perfect. are a bit confused when they see it. Mega. So um, speaking about New York, I mean, uh, there was a famous song about Sting, about an Englishman in New York. How do you feel about living in New York? <laughs> I absolutely love it. It's um, It's such a fun place and there's so much going on. It really forces you to be active and just get on with everything and try something and take risks. And, and that's a really great thing. I think it's very different to England and Europe more broadly where, you know, risk taking is discouraged. And, and if you fail, that's a bad thing. Uh, in America, you know, you're, you're failing is a good thing because you've learned something from it. And yeah. You can kind of go out and try a bunch of different things. And I, I really enjoy it. And for me, it's just great to get out somewhere where um, I could just be myself and do, do my own thing. Yeah. And there's not the kind of expectation around, uh, around the, all the stuff here that there is in England. Yeah. So no one would be surprised if, uh, if Charlie does a fashion brand. <laughs> no, no. Were there ever like ideas of bringing Goodwood abroad? For sure. I think we're not exactly sure what type of event we'll do abroad. Yeah. And there are a number of different options. Sorry, my, uh, my, uh, clock's chiming on the hour. Um, no, I mean, that's perfect. Let's, let's <laughs> listen to it for a minute. I mean, because, I mean, we have to also describe, sorry if I jump into that one for a second. Uh, I assume you're sitting in the library. Yeah. And in front of you, you see a little Ottoman, which has Road Red magazine on it. Yeah. And I can some see other the road rack. I can see classic cars. I can see yeah, classic, yeah. yeah. 
So because, I mean, that's also a very magical place, the library in Goodwood House. I mean, that's really like, you feel like, okay, forget about Harry Potter. This is the real deal. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, you have the like all sure. the uh, modern setup with an, uh, with an iPad and everything. So it's really like a cool combination of having this old room and like this, I assume this watch must be 400 years old. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it must be on, on that, something around yeah. there, yeah. That's sorry, I interrupted you because I just wanted to give you also the atmosphere a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So um, before the watch uh, chimed in, we were speaking about the risk of bringing something abroad. Yeah, Goodwood, the place has played such an amazing role and such an important part in the events. We wouldn't have been able to do it without the history and the the kind of je ne sais quoi that the uh, the event brings through. Yes. I think we can not, we would never try and replicate the feeling or the event that we had here. We yeah. would find somewhere that was able to create its own identity and its own feeling. Got it. So we would use our ex our operational expertise to try and do a, an event somewhere that really engaged with the spirit of the place that we were at, rather than yeah. try to uh, take what we did at Goodwood and put it somewhere else. If you're looking back, I mean, we just spoke about the kind of privilege of growing up on all this, but also being normal. Uh, what are your dearest memories connected to one of the Goodwood events? Yeah, I think if I've been so fortunate to have some amazing memories and to have done some incredible things at Goodwood. One of the funnest was Sebastian Loeb taking me around the rally stage in his WRC car, which was really incredible. Yeah. But the fondest was, I remember when Ken Block came here for the first time. Yeah. And I went in his his original Ford up the hill with him when yeah. he went the first time up the hill. And that was incredible and one of the most fun experiences. And, you know, with the tragedy yes. that happened to him has become an increasingly meaningful memory for me. And he was such a big part of what we did here and such a big supporter of our events. Yeah. Um, that memory is uh, really, really amazing. I mean, he was uh, really like out of this world. The things he could do in a car uh, were just incredible, un unmatched, incredible, absolutely. And it's so, it's so sad. Uh, but and on the other hand, it's like also uh, life goes. And I think if we keep these dear memories, that's the way forward and uh, keeping this alive. I mean, mine was the, for me actually, which was very touching, was the uh, Sterling Moss Memorial when they yeah. uh, reft all the cars and, and bikes yeah, and everything. Yeah. Boah, I mean, that was really like... That yeah, was, uh, we've there have been some amazing moments like that where we're so fortunate to be able to collect and collate and organize very unique sets of cars and people um, who can do those sorts of things. And you know, we have Formula One drive, old Formula One drivers coming back uh, to Goodwood yeah. and driving the cars that they've raced, that they raced in the championship for the first ever time since they drove them in the championship. Yeah. And they come out in tears, in floods of tears. Yeah, um, unbelievable. Huh? Bruno Senna driving Ayrton's. Uh, McLaren at the members meeting two years yeah. ago, things like that, really Quite unique big. things that, you know, we're in a very lucky position to be able to put on and pull together, um, which no one else is really able to do. So that's really a special thing. And I think that's a very nice way to end this podcast and our conversation. So, uh, Charlie, thank you very much for joining us um, and share all these great memories and also the present and the future about the Goodwood events and what happened in Goodwood. Uh, we cannot wait for the next event to come. So thank you very much for your time. Such a pleasure. And also a big thank you to everyone who tuned in. And if you like our podcast, please hit the subscribe button at the podcast service of your choice. And if you really, really like us, we would be more than happy if you leave us a high star rating or any comments about future guests, the quality of the podcast, anything, just let us know. So thank you everyone for joining in and especially thank you, Charlie. See you next time in Goodwood. Thank you so much. See you soon. Perfect. Thank you. Bye-bye.